Hello and welcome everyone to our eighth food safety culture webinar. We are so pleased to have everyone here. We had over 2,500 registrants for this webinar, so it seems many of you are as excited to hear from today's panelists as I know I am. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, my name is Aliza Ronka and I am the manager of the Alliance to Stop Foodborne Illness. For those of you who are returning and used to seeing Vanessa Kaufman welcoming you in, she is at home today watching us not as a moderator, but as a new mom. So I am here today in her stead to represent the Alliance, a wonderful program which brings together industry, academics, and our favorite regulators to work collaboratively on advancing food safety culture throughout the food system. In addition to myself, Conrad Chouanier and Chris Waldrop from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration will serve as your moderators for today's event. Before we dive in, I do want to remind everyone that the chat function, microphones, and cameras are disabled for attendees. You will need to use the Q&A function to ask questions of our panelists. In the Q&A window, you can also upvote questions, and the most popular will rise to the top. As always, you can earn a continuing education credit from each webinar in this series. The details for that are posted on the STOP website and will be distributed via email on Friday. Also on the STOP website, you can find today's webinar and the slides, which will be uploaded tomorrow. Please be aware this webinar is being recorded. As for today's agenda, companies in the Alliance, like those represented here today, are leaders in the food industry, but every food company, even those with strong food safety cultures, are on a journey. No matter how well planned or prepared for, all journeys meet inevitable bumps in the road. And we are here today to examine the importance of how you and your organization prepare for and respond to those bumps. Intentionally building and maintaining a strong, positive food safety culture is one way to help navigate the rough patches, learn from them, and build organizational resilience. Speaking to this important topic, we have Lone Jesperson, Principal of Cultivate, who will set the stage, and our featured panelists, Al Amanza and Carrie Bridges. Al is the Global Head of Food Safety and Quality Assurance at JBS, where he is a globally recognized expert in international sanitary standards and food safety requirements for meat and poultry. Al came to JBS after nearly 40 years with USDA FSIS, leading science-based food safety modernization efforts, regulatory strategies, and public health efforts. Carrie is the Vice President of Food Safety at Chipotle, where she leads the team enforcing Chipotle's zero tolerance policy focused on food safety across the supply chain, in restaurant practices, food preparation, and employee training. Carrie has served as the President of IAFP, a board member of GFSI, and has 20 years of experience overseeing food safety, including programs at Walmart, Tesco, and Jack in the Box. I know they are both eager to share their experiences and insights to help us be adaptable and face food safety challenges. I want to thank them in advance for being here today, and I know we're looking forward to hearing their unique perspectives and journeys. But first, I'm going to pass the microphone over to Conrad to give a few words from the FDA. Thank you, Elisa, and thank you all for joining today. Uh, I also want to thank the uh, the Alliance for, to Alliance for Stop uh, Foodborne Illness for for this collaboration. Um, this collaboration really has served as a cornerstone for FDA's um, efforts to learn about the experiences, the opportunities, the challenges that industry has faced uh, in trying to mature and develop their own food safety cultures within their organizations. Uh, but more importantly, we see this as uh, the cornerstone of our efforts to, to, to foster collaboration across the food industry, uh, for us to share learnings, uh, share best practices in order to advance food safety culture across the whole food system. So we're, on behalf of FDA, we wanna welcome you today. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to this discussion about resiliency in food safety culture. And so without further delay, I'd like to pass this on to Loan. Thank you so much, Conrad. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining us today on this important topic. So uh, when we're talking about facing food safety challenges through culture and adaptability, I think we can probably take a starting point in looking at 
Um, so what is the consequences of culture on our food safety performance in the first place? And if we go to the next slide, Elise. Um, so this is a, a study that came out in Harvard Business Review uh, some time ago now, but it's still very valid. We know from uh, studies in quality culture that is more or stronger cultures have less mistakes in, in, uh, and it's quantifiable. And we know uh, that from, from uh, the studies that that uh, Shinashiro and, and Curry did. So what this means is that if we have a more a stronger culture that we might be more preventative, we might be more risk oriented, et cetera, versus if we have a weaker culture. And I think that's really relevant as we're talking about how to adapt to challenges. So if we go to the next one, um, what I wanted to do is just try and put that in perspective in two scenarios. So what does it mean to have a strong culture? What, do, what are some of the characteristics of a stronger culture versus one that might be more on the early stages of uh, the journey of maturing? So there's the tale of two recalls. Um, same situation, two companies that both found salmonella and then chocolate products. And in company number one here, products were in the market um, and a full class recall or class one recall was initiated. And there were some consumer illnesses that were reported. There was some significant brand and employee impact, and um, that's cost obviously costing the company, but more importantly, um, put both the consumers and also the employees at risk. So that was the really impact of that particular challenging situation for company number one. If we then look at company number two, um, the contaminated products did not make it in the marketplace. There were no consumer illness reported, obviously, um, and when uh, we looked at the consequences from that recall, there was uh, very little to no brand impact and employees um, improved the systems and validated this through EMP performance as opposed to having to react to containing a recall. So the setup for what I'd like to share with you are really this uh, particular situation for these two companies, same type of commodity, but very different outcomes of a contamination of uh, salmonella in this case. So why was that? Um, if we dive into the first company, uh, which is uh, the next slide, please. Um, a company, I know that this is very a small font, but we will make this available to you as well. What I wanna do is just look at, so what were the situation, what were the behaviors that we saw across four groups in this first company? Leadership team, the quality manager uh, and the quality team, the production supervisory team, um, or individuals in that role, and then also the frontline team members. So if we look at first what's happening within a leadership team, and that's uh, company number one that's really at a very early stage maturity, um, very little food safety and quality performance reviews. Um, so leaders would not be engaged in looking at how we actually faring, um, including what we learn from environmental monitoring. Traceability exercise, uh, exercises were really taken based on uh, reducing the time it took to meet an external standard requirement. So instead of thinking about traceability as um, building that muscle around how we our social norms, our systems are functioning, if we do need to get our arms around something that shouldn't be in the marketplace, this was really just one of the tick and flick um, the last one in the leadership team in this early stage maturity was that there was an investment in rapid testing um, equipment that had been put forward by the quality team, but that had been rejected uh, because it wasn't deemed um, a good investment. So, and there was some cost savings going on. So those were sort of three uh, social norms that influenced uh, the company getting to this uh, stage of mature or stage this, these consequences from the the recall. If we look at number two, then in the quality department, specifically around the manager, really new in role um, and first time leading any recall. So there was very little experience there. Quality manager and the team were seen as the food safety police on a daily basis, and I, and I think this will resonate with many of you. But it's really a situation where actions are taken on food safety. Um, because of quality finding an issue or that there's a problem that's been raised. Quality is often the, the department as well that will then lead the root cause analysis and the reaction to a problem. So it's very much in this policing state as opposed to uh, being a partner in business. The envir environmental sampling plan in this case was not validated um, and there was very little uh, trend analysis as well around roasting temperatures. So 
a very um, early stage maturity when it comes to both uh, the norms around how to use food safety data, but certainly also uh, in how quality was even a, uh, built in as a business partner as opposed to um, being uh, that insurance policy that, that sits in the drawer until something happens. If we then look at um, the production supervisory staff, that middle management that's uh, close to the front line, um, this, one of them was, there was or multiple had a um, long time standing in the company, so in up to 30 years, um, had never really taken part in traceability exercises. So couldn't really pitch in, um, didn't have any muscle building in around what do we do if, my, or if there are products in the market that we need to get our hands around. And was not involved at all in the EMP, in the environmental monitoring program or any of this data trending uh, around the, the critical control points around roasting. So the production supervisor obviously had lots of uh, things to do, but food safety and quality was not part of it. So there's two norms there that really also um, drove to the results that we saw in the previous slide of um, both brand impact and, and consumer impact. Team members at the front line are not involved at all in, in the recording of roasting temperatures. And we're really trained once a year to pass the um, GM, uh, on GMP to pass the audit. So once a year, refresh your training. I know that's gonna resonate with a lot of you, um, but this might be just an encouragement to all of you to say, so refresh your training. Are we actually validating that the knowledge is transferred and doing what we needed to? Or is it something we do again for tick and flick? And there was a very high turnover, which I know that uh, many are dealing with these days. So that was really the situation that led to the consequences of the first company's recall uh, or the contamination, sorry, with salmonella. So if we go to the second slide and look at the second company, a little bit of a different situation. So this is a company that didn't get par uh, products in the marketplace um, and also didn't have any recorded illness. The leadership team in this uh, case have a, a good rhythm of a monthly uh, trend review so that they're looking at uh, leading indicators and that includes um, their findings uh, around EMP zoning so really not just um, product contact services but also going out and looking at more remote zonings as well do we are, are there creeping risks creeping in and management team or leadership team would be involved in that monthly day uh, of walking a mile and uh, for each leadership team and what that means is that uh, each leadership team member would be out for a day actually uh, working in an area um, on the production floor somewhere else and walking a day in in the uh, a mile in the day uh, no, a mile in the shoe of some of the people that are actually acting on food safety every day hands on um and that really also just helped uh, create a sort of psychological connection if you would with those that are on the floor of course but also with food safety in action and um, there was all there was some really good traceability uh, records uh, over and beyond what the external standards would be calling for. So really active uh, leadership team with some really strong social norms around trying to uh, engage across uh, different roles in the company, but also for the leadership team to really have a personal connection to food safety, what it means for their company. If we then look at the quality function in this case, um, some key processing parameters for trending and it was discussed with Hazard Team Weekly. Now have the Hazard Team in this case, a really uh, active Hazard Team, so not a Hazard Team that were there to just show up and, and again, fulfill a requirement, but there was some frequent, very heated discussions in that Hazard Team, which we like to see. Um, quality was also a, acting more as a coach for supervisors, uh, specifically in the production area. Um, which really led to that they developed this EMS program between food safety and EHS. So feedback from the frontline supervisors and, and production was that it, let's not have another program that's different from what we already have. And in this case, it was an EMS program for EHS. Let's try and integrate, so improve on the current program while we also integrate food safety into it. And that was really well received and, and production really took ownership of the EMS program um, after having seen that reaction. And then there was a, a trainer for, for new traceability members as well. So an ongoing, just building the muscle on the traceability side of things. The production supervisor, um, daily conversation with team members about processing parameters and EMS uh, uh, findings as well. So 
again, bringing data to the table. And I know you're going to hear much more about that from Alan Carey today, but it's a daily conversation that the supervisor can have. And it's not a daily communication. It's a daily conversation. There's a difference between that. I think we sometimes assume the conversation is one way, um, but this, these are conversations that they're having. So there's lots of listening involved in that and also um, just good debates, let's call it that. Rotating leaders um, in and out of the near-miss program. So um, somebody has to lie awake at night worrying about these programs. And in this case, it was uh, that leadership role was rotated through supervisors. And then there was a, a very um, big commitment to uh, certifying new employees to, specifically to the roles that they're in. What that means is that uh, there's been so, uh, some work done on what is the food safety responsibility for each of the roles um, in our production facility or in our restaurant or in our store. And having a learning program that actually tailors specifically to those roles as opposed to a generic food safety training only. This is a big uh, undertaking, but very impactful because now I can actually take uh, action on what I need to do specifically in my role around food safety instead of just blanket know that food safety is important and that's the level we need to get to to be able to really change norms and behaviors because um intuitively we all know that food safety is important when we get into our everyday jobs there are the priorities other things we need to focus on and making sure that food safety is uh, spelled out in specific terms for what we do every day in our roles individual roles is really key and in this company it's about certifying to that role as well Team members certified um, to the roles and again, in an integrated way. So both for EHS, environmental health and safety, people safety, quality food safety, and also for operational effectiveness. So team members would have this from the get-go, very integrated view of that food safety is one of the three that makes us successful in reaching our goals and delivering on what we, on what we said we were gonna do. There was a norm of speaking up freely in daily team meetings. I'm laughing a little bit because it's very vocal sometimes. Um, and again, about all three of these uh, topics and then um, very long-standing members in the company. So this kind of culture obviously is impacting the outcome of recall, but it certainly also has influence in general on how people feel about the company and about uh, wanting to stay. And I think that's because this is very much a an approach of setting some norms that fit into the overall culture of the company as well. It's not just something that we rock up and say that this is important for food safety. So if I was to wrap this up um, in the next slide, just with a couple of things, uh, a couple of takeaways. Um, I think this integration is really important when we talk about facing food safety challenges and how our culture and, and adaptability helps us. Um, because integration of both what we measure for food safety, what the practices and the norms are, um, makes food safety part of what we do every day, not something unique that we do when there's a problem. And I think that's how we can better weather some of these challenges that we see in recalls or uh, if there's a, a non-conformance uh, within our four walls. The second one I would say is that um, a mature culture um, is more a function of a mature organizational culture than not. Uh, when we do the measurements, it's very much um, feedback to organizations about their organizational culture as well. And I think that's really also important to just keep re 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 reiterating um, because especially when you're talking with your leaders, um, their organizational culture responsibility might be more clear to them than um, how food safety fits in. And it's just about realigning and saying that, well, our food safety culture is part of our organizational culture. It's not something standalone. Um, and having it uh, in as one of the critical disciplines is, uh, is part of what caused uh, the outcomes in this these two cases to be different than what it otherwise would be. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Al, and I'm really excited to uh, to hear uh, your learnings and based on all of your vast experience, Al. So um, over to you. Well, thank you, Lone. And um, certainly want to start out by thanking the Alliance and uh, I mean, for this opportunity. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to, to share <clears throat> information and also uh, to be able to tell tell a story, right? I, I think that that's fundamentally what 
what we we need to do here. Um, so we'll go ahead and go to the uh, to the first slide, and um, we're going to start with obviously resiliency in the face of food safety culture problems. And I'm not going to read these uh, these slides other than this first one because it's it's probably the most important one. Where you go, food safety culture is one of the most important. I'd say not one, but it is the most important component to consider when managing a food business. It encompasses behaviors, attitudes, practices that prior to, uh, prioritize food safety. <clears throat> Foods, uh, food safety culture encourages employees to follow safety protocols and helps to ensure the safety of consumers, no matter what they are faced with. So what does that mean? What that means is everyone, everyone, and, and I'm talking about from the minute um, an animal uh, or product is brought through the front gates of a, of a facility, they are involved in food safety. And I used to say this back when I worked at USDA, it doesn't matter where you sit. If you can be a secretary, uh, an administrative assistant, you can be in charge of security. Everything within that facility is related to food safety because the folks that are actually working on the line, actually doing um, the jobs on on the um, on the line, they are able to do that um, in comfort and understanding that everyone around them is doing their job, and there comes there is some comfort in that uh, because uh, if you don't have to worry whether you're going to get paid or not, if you don't have to worry about somebody coming through the gates to um, to cause a problem, then that helps the folks that are actually working on the lines uh, to do their job without thinking about those possibilities. Uh, next slide. I'm not a big quote guy, but um, I watched um, this podcast by DeWitt Jones and probably most of y'all don't know who DeWitt is. He's a photographer for National Geographic. And uh, I would encourage you to uh, to listen to this podcast simply, be, and he has nothing to do with food, but this quote, our vision controls our perception and our perception controls our reality. When you listen, uh, I mean, in the food industry, this is, this is it, uh, our perceptions and our reality, right? Because the things that we, we look at, the things that we do, the things that we see, um, these are all things that form uh, how we act and how we behave every single day. Next slide. <clears throat> um, so I have to say, before I start with these, is food safety uh, is something that starts at the top. You have to have the support of your CEOs. You have to have the support of your managers and supervisors because everyone has a food safety culture. Doesn't matter. You may not you may not think that, but everybody has one. And um, Loan certainly drove that home. She did a conference for us uh, a few months ago and kind of walked us through. Everybody has a food safety culture. Everybody's at a different place, but everybody has a food safety culture within their within their business. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go to these. So developing a resilient mindset is probably uh, the most key to success in, in that environment. It requires focusing on what you can control and staying positive, embracing the challenge, uh, ensuring that everyone truly understands their role. And I use that example in HR, insurance, accounting, doesn't matter where you are. Um, and then management input and the drive to commitment is crucial. Uh, here at JBS, uh, one of the things that I was brought here for is to be, to make JBS not only a leader, but being at the top of food safety. And so that commitment uh, is certainly something that is makes it easy for me to do my job, but ensuring uh, that everyone understands a why, uh, of why of why of what we do and what we don't do. Next slide. So there, there it is, getting the message across to diverse cultures. And I think everyone in this industry understands that. Uh, different cultures react differently. I uh, am fortunate that I have a very strong FSQA team um, in down in South America, Brazil, uh, in Mexico, in the UK, 
uh, down in Australia and here in the U.S. Um, I'm fortunate that I have a great team that understands it strives to be the best uh, in food safety. And they not only strive to do the best, but they look for opportunities to make them better, regardless of what they're doing. Um, I think turnover was one of the things that was already talked about. It's one of the biggest weaknesses for our teams. It's hard to establish a consistent, solid culture. And, and certainly having in some of our facilities up to 30 different cultures that you have to be able to understand how they operate. You have to understand different ways of communication, different ways of getting them to understand that food safety is number one every single day, regardless of anything else that's, that's happening. Um, obviously right now, um, the seasons of having very tight margins, um, that's, that's something that, uh, that people can use as an excuse not to, not to be able to improve or not to do better. Um, we certainly do not do that. Uh, and, and that's, uh, that's something that I believe it can make you better, uh, because let's face it, food safety doesn't really have a return on investment, right? That you can see. It's the things that you do behind the scenes that make you better and that keep you from having recalls or event periods, suspensions and or market bans. Next slide. So there, I kind of talked about a, uh, that a bit, uh, leadership support. Um, and that's that kind of goes in both uh, industry and in uh, when I was at USDA, um, I never had a problem with leadership support um, at USDA. Uh, and, and one of the reasons for that, and people ask, like, doesn't it matter who the secretary is and things happen? I'll tell you this, uh, food safety is kind of like an apolitical type of, uh, of, a, of, a, of, of, well, I was, I, I would say I was fortunate because nobody ever didn't want food safety. Didn't matter whether there was a Republican, Democrat, everybody was driven to to help um, for uh, doing the best that we could uh, as, as a regulatory agency. And then the multidisciplinary approach, uh, not solely driven by QA. Uh, Loan kind of talked about the daily, weekly, monthly meetings with operations, uh, the food safety scorecard and goals consistent with, um, uh, with, with what we discussed, uh, food safety indicators for the operations with KPIs, building those in so that it keeps people focused, uh, microbiological data that we review uh, daily, weekly, monthly, and, and, and keep those uh, data systems uh, active so that we, we don't lose sight of that. And then uh, always looking for better software for data collection and analytics to help us. Um, and then finally, uh, fighting back complacency, even in good times. Uh, and that's one of the things that it doesn't matter whether you're in, in, in government uh, or uh, in private industry, you launch these efforts and, and how do you maintain that level of, of urgency, right? Because what happens is you launch this, this brand new food safety initiative. And so how do you keep that at top of mind and those are some of the challenges that we deal with. Uh, but I think uh, we've come up with some really good uh, ideas on how to have um, monthly reminders and, and biannual reminders of, of why it is important uh, so that we keep food safety at top of mind. Uh, next slide. And so resiliency in the face of uh, food safety culture problems uh, I, I kind of left this blank because I just want to talk about in government, uh, USDA, you have a static workforce uh, for the most part, and you have um, most of the folks that, hey, everybody that comes to work there, they know that their number one job is food safety every single day as a regulator. Uh, in industry, you have continuous change acquisitions of other businesses. Um, and so that those are challenges that, that you have. But how, how we manage those in industry is a little bit different, right? We continue to acquire new, new, uh, new businesses. And uh, what we do is we go in and 
and reprogram people, right? To get them to understand the JBS way of food safety. And quite frankly, it's worked very well for us. Um, and we continue to do that. Uh, the risk in government can be lower, uh, certainly because you have an entire workforce that their primary focus is food safety, food safety, food safety. That's, that's the way they operate. Uh, the risk can be a bit higher in industry as the objective is a bit more focused on brand and protecting the brand. Uh, adaptability and, uh, and communication in, in USDA, that's rather simple, especially when uh, you're the administrator and you get to drive those kinds of messages. And then uh, industry, it makes it, for me, it made it easy uh, or makes it easy now, uh, simply because I have that global platform and I'm able to communicate globally with all our FSQA folks and, uh, and helping them understand uh, the, uh, the importance of food safety. And finally, uh, I got to throw this in here, and this has nothing to do with food safety, but I think you'll understand the gist of it. When you have um, food safety, uh, and that is your, that is your culture, you got to get people to believe in you. You have to get people to believe in the brand. And so I, this is just a recent example. I mean, here you have, uh, and I don't know how many of y'all are football fans, but here you have uh, at Colorado, um, Deion Sanders. Here he comes to coach. He comes from a, from a college that basically people were saying he's taking over a program that won one game last year. And then he was criticized because he got rid of the entire roster, 86 new players, and, uh, and he, he takes over a brand new team. People at the beginning, there's no way because that's not the way that, that coll collegiate football works. And then he takes on the first game, uh, a team that, uh, that played for the national championship last year. They lost, but they played in the national championship, and they win. And so he's gotten – this whole new group of 86 players to believe and to trust and to understand that this culture that he has brought is going to be successful. And so getting people to believe in your culture is crucial. And that is fundamentally one of the things that regardless of what business you're in, if you are a leader and you can get people to buy in, that's the type of success that you have. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Al. Um, and thank you so much for um, the Alliance for inviting me here today. So my name is Carrie Bridges. I oversee um, food safety and quality at Chipotle. And um, I think when Elisa kicked off this webinar and talked about bumps in the road, it really is no um, secret that, or surprise that Chipotle did have our fair share of bumps in the road back in 2015, 2016. It's all very public, um, but I think it's important to share just the tremendous amount of investment and time and just absolute understanding at our company that we have zero room for error and that we need to maintain a world-class food safety program. So Lisa, if you wanna to go to the next slide, um, today, I'm just going to talk through just six specific strategies. I'm not going to drain these slides because I'm really excited about the Q&A at the end of this um, session. But I think just at a high level, um, how important it is to have clear communication out to the restaurant so everybody understands expectations, uh, how important it is to have help readily available 24-7. So I'll talk a little bit about what we do to, to offer that support and help. And then maximizing KPIs. How do we measure and track performance with our key performance indicators? And how do we use that data to really drive the decisions and, um, and find where restaurants are needing the most support? And then uh, recognize and reward our employees, but also hold them accountable to execute food safety and then finally, how does this all lead to continuous improvement? So Lisa, if you wanna to go to the next slide. So I'll start with clear communication. Um, and also this is a great example of just sharing best practices. This is something, to this, this picture to the right is our Food Safety 7. And um, this goes back to Walmart's high five. And back when I was at Walmart, uh, we invited Dr. Marsden, um, who was the head of food safety at the time at Chipotle, out to Walmart in Bentonville, Arkansas, just to share best practices, which I can't encourage doing that enough. 
Um, and we, from there, Dr. Marsden took um, the creation of Chipotle's Food Safety 7. So this poster is everywhere and really just, you know, using infographics and boiling it down to the seven essential um, principles that we want our employees to memorize and execute day in and day out. Um, in addition to this, we do have obviously very robust training. So prior to even working with any of the food in our restaurants, you are required to go through an onboarding training. Um, we also have very specific quarterly food safety training. So out of all, you know, 3,200 restaurants, over 100,000 employees, everybody is expected to take quarterly food safety training. And we really tailor that to, you know, what do we want our employees to really understand right now? So we also have weekly uh, food safety notes that are sent out to the restaurants. So we're getting into flu and cold season. So probably the team will put together a robust training around ensuring that we work healthy, which is, you know, the first point here on our food safety seven. All right, so you wanna go to the next slide, Elisa. So this point um, or strategy around making health readily available, I think it's it's critical to our success that we're constantly um, available to support our restaurants and our teams. So on our food safety team, we have a regional field food safety support team that's out visiting the restaurants. Um, and we also have a food safety hotline available 24 seven. So restaurants are able to call that in addition to having an ethics hotline. So if somebody wants to report something anonymously, but the point is that there's help available. So as much as we wanna train, we wanna reinforce our best practices, it's critical that they have a phone that they could pick up and text or call somebody that's gonna be there either physically to help or support them and troubleshoot over the phone. All right, you wanna to go to the next slide. And then Al touched on this, just how important it is to have to your key performance indicators. And, you know, whether that's restaurant facing KPIs where we're looking at, um, you know, it's it's third party EcoSure audits that are hitting the restaurant. So we're looking at that data. We're looking for repeat non-conformances. Uh, we're looking for any trends. We also look at uh, training compliance. So how many of our employees have done the onboarding training? Have they completed the quarterly food safety training? Also on the supply side, we do have a lot of metrics around um, supplier certification. We look at any foreign material complaints that may be coming through and identify any trends. And then also on the restaurant side, we do look at employee illness allegations as much as customer illness allegations. So there is a lot of data that's coming through. And with these KPIs, I think it's, it's very important, obviously, as a food safety team, we're looking at this data to understand which of our restaurants or suppliers are needing additional support. But at the same time, who is getting visibility to those KPIs, I think is very important. Um, at Chipotle, actually our board of directors at Chipotle is here this week. So I'll be meeting with them to share all of our food safety KPIs. And that's a standing agenda item for every single board meeting. And then we also have a food safety advisory council, which I, you know, I can't stress enough if you don't have this a, a council already. Um, this has been key, I think, to some of Chipotle's success is working closely with some of industry's you know, best and brightest, like we've got Dr. Atchison, we have Hal King, we have Dr. Elizabeth Hagen, um, you know, Jim Marsden, obviously, and then also Frank Giannis just recently joined us. And they're meeting with us every single quarter in Newport Beach. And we share our KPIs and we also give updates on projects. We share our pain points and it's a really good strategy just to keep with continuous improvement, which I'll talk about in a minute. You wanna to go to the next slide? And then um, you know, with KPIs, obviously, you're, what are you doing with that data and making decisions? Um, a couple examples I just wanted to provide, which gives us a lot of visibility. Since we are 100% company owned with all of our restaurants, all of the data does centrally roll up to our teams at our headquarters. Um, and one example is we call it digital HACCP. And so these are Bluetooth thermometers in every single one of our restaurants. So we get the visibility to understand have the restaurants um, taken temperatures and are they doing this timely? Are they not doing it at all? Is there an escalation process in place? So there's a lot of data rolling up that gives us good visibility. Um, also central tracking and monitoring of customer illness allegations and employee illness allegations. Um, we're uniquely positioned that all of that data again is rolling up to our headquarters. So we can see in real time if there's an employee alleging illness and a customer alleging illness, and can we put some proactive uh, measures onto that restaurant? Something, for example, we call NPP. So it's our norovirus prevention program. So if there is um, something concerning or brewing happening within that restaurant or that region, then we have the ability to put some additional procedures in place. And that might be heightened hand watching. Um, we'll, you know, do, um, you know, we'll hit the restaurant with bleach. We won't carry over food. We're not going to share employees. And so there is this very robust protocol that we put in place in abundance of caution if we're starting to get that visibility. So it is, it's a great program. Um, and another one is obviously looking at all of our health department inspections. 
third-party EcoShore audit data. And all of that data is giving us great insights to help us understand, again, which restaurants are needing additional support. Another one that I didn't list here, but I think it's important um, to bring up is these are, you know, looking at our EcoShore audits and health department visits, even our own food safety checks done by the regional field food safety team or our field leaders. It's, it's very powerful data, but I think it's important to take into maybe some other metrics that maybe you don't consider food safety metrics. An example for us, we, we put together, um, it's called Project Foray. And that data isn't only looking at our food safety checks, but it's also taking into consideration some people checks. So we take into consideration with Project Foray, how, uh, what is the tenure of the manager that's leading that restaurant? Because it's really important for us to identify that if a restaurant has a manager that's brand new, you know, there might be some increased risk there. We look at, is that restaurant fully staffed to that model? Because if it's not, then there may be some prone to have shortcuts. And some of these learnings came from some root cause analysis work that we did a few years ago, understanding back in 2015, 2016, what are the restaurants that had problems and really understanding why. And, you know, I think, I don't think it's a big surprise to understand that some of these restaurants that did have a problem didn't necessarily look bad on paper. They didn't have terrible health department visits. They didn't have a terrible EcoSure, but there were some contributing factors that made that a riskier restaurant. So we really tried to take into consideration not just our food safety checks, but maybe some other you know, people <laughs> elements or, or data points that should be considered as we're looking at that restaurant holistically. So you wanna to go to the next slide, Lisa? So I think um, Chipotle does a great job of recognizing and rewarding our employees. And this really keeps the employees motivated and engaged. Um, so for example, all of our um, employees, they have to pass uh, their, their um, food safety audits or they're not gonna be eligible for their bonus. And this isn't like they get a fraction of their bonus, they actually get none of their bonus. Like they need to pass food safety. So obviously that's a motivating factor. And um, some other examples is anytime a restaurant achieves 100%, our chief operating officer is gonna personally send them um, a note, just congratulating them and encouraging them to keep up the good food safety practices. And I think that's another really good example. We also take advantage of anytime our employees are together. So we have you know all managers conference, we have a field leader conference, and we do get on stage and we present food safety awards for those employees and restaurant teams that are, um, are doing a great job of food safety. And then same for suppliers, when we bring our suppliers together, we're very intentional about recognizing a supplier that really has been above and beyond on food safety. So great examples, I think, of where we recognize and reward, but also I, I feel it's very important that you hold employees accountable. So an example of this is we do have some policies that there's zero tolerance around. And an example of that is our wellness check. So anytime you come in to work at Chipotle, you're gonna be stopped before you can even clock in and ask a series of questions about your health. How are you feeling? Are you healthy enough to be at work today? And um, if you don't do those checks, then unfortunately um, you may be terminated. And we take this very seriously. It's it seldom happens, I think, because we just reinforce over and over how important what we call CCP1 is on working healthy. Uh, but it does happen. So I think it's also important just to, to highlight, you need to hold folks accountable when, when they're not executing on that piece. So if you wanna go to the next slide, Elisa. And I'll, and I'll just end here with continuous improvement. Um, I think there's a lot of ways that you can continuously look at your own um, KPIs. I think, you know, Frank Giannis always reinforced with me when I worked for him at Walmart, how important it is that we can't do food safety the same year after year. And that really resonates with me because I think, you know, the challenges change, uh, you know, what, what the business is focusing on change, the risks are changing. So every year, if not more often than that, you really you need to look at your KPIs and make sure, are you measuring the right things? Um, at the same time, I mentioned how important it is to even attend webinars like this, attend conferences, but also reach out. So as much as you're looking internally, I think it's important to look externally. I've had some great benchmarking sessions with Chick-fil-A where, where, you know, I bring my whole team with their team and we talk about best practices and common pains. And there are some great learnings that have come out of some of those meetings. Just last week, I was on the phone with Dr. Al at Cheesecake Factory and just, you know, having a great conversation with him and, and so willing to share best practices. So, and I know I, I personally love getting those calls and I, I can't stress that enough. If you're, if you're looking to continuously improve and raise the bar on your culture, you've got to understand you know, what is industry doing and how can we collectively improve? And I think you'd be surprised to learn how many people are willing to share. It really, um, it, I think it's, it's something you really need to take advantage of as much as possible.
So I'll end there so that we can turn it over to Q&A. Great, thank you. Thank you both, or all three of you actually, for, for those presentations. Um, and so uh, Chris Waldrop and I will be uh, trying to challenge you with some questions we've been getting uh, from the Q&A. Uh, and actually, I'm going to pick on you, Al, first, but this question is really for all of you. Um, but there was something that you had said in particular, Al, that I don't agree with. And <laughs> I think I've said mm -hmm. it in the past, and that is that food safety culture starts from the top. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you why, but you followed it up with something that I do agree with. And that is, you know, food safety culture can't succeed unless you have leadership buy-in and support. And, and the first question, there's been two questions that have been going back and forth in terms of which one's in the lead, but they're both related. And though the first one um, really gets at that is like, how, how do you change the idea that the food safety and quality team are the ones that are in charge of food safety culture, that they're the police and that it's, it's their responsibility. Um, and, and I think that's a, a, a a challenge that has come up a lot in these webinars. And I wanted to hear from bro both of you, any suggestions for, for the participants on this issue? Yeah, uh, so um, I, I understand why you don't necessarily agree about the, uh, the top down, uh, but look, I mean, it takes that commitment, right? And th those are the folks that hold the, the purse strings. And so obviously if they say, you know what, food safety, you go and do, then you don't have to worry about that. The other piece about being the food safety police, uh, there's only one food safety police and those are the regulators. And, and, and so uh, I would say that it takes uh, really a team effort with QA and production. And that's something that, that we've worked really, really hard at for the last six years since I've been here. Not that it didn't exist before, but also um, working with the regulators, right? Because if, if you can establish a relationship with the regulators and production with QA, then ultimately that's what works the best, right? Because everybody's working toward the same goals. Everybody wants the same thing. And it doesn't become competitive between, between production and, and QA. I'll just add to that. I mean, I think I'm I'm fortunate to work for a company that, that just absolutely understands what happens if we don't execute food safety. And so, and it actually was pretty eye-opening for me when I first joined, because I'd be walking down the halls in our corporate office and I'd see the marketing team meeting and they'd be talking about food safety. And then I'd be walking about the culinary team and they're talking about food safety. And at first I'm like, why like my team's not even in there? Why are they why are they talking about food safety? But it's so well understood that if you don't have the food safety buy-in and the compliance there, it's going to make their lives harder. Like we don't want to, we don't want to figure out in the 11th hour, right before we're trying to push a new item out to the restaurants, that it doesn't meet our food safety compliance requirements and take them right back to the beginning. And I think they've realized these cross-functional teams that I work with, that it's in everyone's best interest to bring food safety to the table at the very beginning. Otherwise down the road, it's just going to increase challenges and delay timelines and everything else. So, you know, I do think um, having that cross-functional support one other example I'll just share very quickly is I think a, a good way to get that cross-functional buy-in. I mentioned that we have these, these food safety advisory council meetings that happen every quarter. I intentionally bring in leaders from supply chain. I bring in leaders from legal and also marketing, culinary, ops. They're all there at the table. So they're hearing, you know, not only from our industry partners, like what are, you know, what are these challenges and how important they are, but they're a part of that discussion. And that's been, I think, a great culture play to get that buy-in that everybody's responsible, not just the food safety team. Yeah, All right, that's can great, I toss I in a, a suggested uh, addition? Oh, Chris. Go ahead, Lynn. Sorry if there's a bit of a delay, Chris, I apologize, but I just wanted to build on Alan and Kerry's points there. And, and I think it's it, it comes to sort of a, a point, Conrad, where, um, and we've talked about this in a previous webinar, measure what you treasure. So if you measure food, your food safety success through compliance to external audits and to regulatory compliance, then I think you get those behaviors because those that are best equipped to deliver that are the people in food safety and quality because that's what we do. That's what we've been trained to do. That's what we do. But if you measure 
for example, engagement in Gemba Walk across your leadership team. So uh, did all um, leaders do their Gemba Walk at the set time in the schedule that you put out there? Did they bring back some information that goes into the continuous improvement? I love that you brought that in, Kerry. Um, so that you're measuring that system performance as opposed to measuring passing and audit. I think that drives different behaviors. And that can also help you then put food safety in context of those different functional areas that have to play with us in food safety. Finance, marketing, all of the support functions, don't really like that term, but still, um, all of the functions that make a company successful in making the food and selling the food, serving the food that they do every day. So I think we have to bring it back to what's actually the value we put on food safety in our company and shifting that to a measure of value that's much more um, tied to the business success and uh, all the functions that makes that happen. Yeah, thanks, Sloan. That's great because I think some of the folks were asking for actual examples or, or you know, tips that they could use. And so those the things that you all said have been very helpful in that. Uh, Carrie, there was one question for you about, or a couple questions I'm going to kind of put together about your training and whether uh, in-person versus digital or versus online training, like is there a difference? Is one better than the other? And then does it sometimes, like Chipotle went through a, a you know, event and did that inform how Chipotle then thinks about food safety and how you maybe change some of your training, some of your other programs because of that event? Yeah, sure. Both really good questions. And I'll address the first one first on, you know, whether it's in person versus computer based. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of both. I think like the computer based programs, the CBLs are great because you can do some knowledge checks. You really get the data that each person individually has like sat down and taken that course. But I, I never um, think that that's a substitute for the shoulder to shoulder training that needs to take place and having those conversations are, are critically important. And so, you know, we talk about um, you know, who is my army of, of, of trainers that are out there. And so every field leader, so for perspective, a field leader has nine restaurants that they manage. So each restaurant has a food safety leader, but then there's a field leader. That field leader is also responsible for coaching and training just as much as my regional field food safety manager. So they're surrounded by people that are doing that shoulder to shoulder in-person training and coaching on the spot. But yes, there is an element of a computer-based learning. So you know, not to make a, give you a too long of an answer here, but it is a combination of the two. And I would never say computer-based learning is, is a substitute for the in-person. I think we all saw that over COVID when my kids were all trying to learn over a computer and only over a computer, like <laughs> there was some challenges for them and for me as the parent. But I think, I really, I do think that the, the person component people to people is really important. And then second, um, I guess the question was what learnings did we have, I guess, from some of the root cause analysis work and does that um, help direct us to where we should focus our training. And absolutely, yes. I think there was a lot of learnings for us. I mentioned one of them of not only just looking at health department scores or our own EcoSure scores, but taking into consideration just other metrics that are happening in that restaurant. How do we support? But our training is is very specific to what is happening for that month or even that week. And so we have an opportunity to communicate weekly, but then there's a monthly as well as a quarterly. So as you know, situations arise and we we find out like, hey, we need to really reinforce this practice because we're slipping here, then we're gonna customize and tailor the training in that way. Al, did you have any thoughts on that? No, I mean, we obviously, we do both and we're fortunate that we have a partner that does our, uh, our micro testing that provides training for us both uh, by computer and, and in person. And, and it, I, I mean, I think that kind of like Carrie said, we learned a lot through COVID and, uh, and I mean, before COVID we think, no, it has to be in person, but man, we learned a lot of lessons. And I think it's a, it's a positive thing because the technology has gotten so good that now it's just, it's just a natural, we can do it. And it's very, uh, very effective. Yep. So um, I don't think I see this question in the chat, but I want to make sure I, ask it. Um, you know, you, you both brought up COVID and Carrie, in your presentation, you talked about this work healthy um, component to your food uh -huh. safety. And I know that we have a lot of small companies online. And I know that uh, Al, you raised the whole point of a lot of turnover. So how, how do you, you know, can you talk a little bit about the challenges of implementing that aspect of your 
of your program and maintaining it and and any pointers you might have for maybe smaller restaurants that that might find that difficult yeah i'll i'll, I'll share then I'll, I'll i'm sure you have, have thoughts on this as well but for us what we did um, at chipotle is every employee starts with three days of, of sick leave so you have that from day one like you don't need to accrue that and that really is just giving um, a, you know additional layer of look. Just don't come to work sick. We'll pay you even if if you're sick and you're not gonna you're not able to show up. So that's that's there and available for day one. And then I mentioned the the wellness check, and that did really set us up for success through COVID. We had already had that. I think a lot of different companies implemented that as you know when COVID was happening, but we already had that process in place. And the reality is it's it's very, very few people actually come to the restaurants and say, oh, yep, sorry, I can't come and I'm sick. They're usually calling in from home to say, hey, I'm not feeling well, I'm not able to make it. And we take it very seriously. And, and we know on some level, like it does get abused, right? Like I can see a new Marvel movie gets introduced and suddenly like my call offs are like skyrocketing in specific regions or, you know, there's great weather in a part of the country and it's Friday. It's like I'm going to get a lot of call offs and allegations of people not feeling well but I'm okay with it. I think it's just so well understood that you don't come to work if you're not feeling well. And the way that we have it set up, and I mentioned this is if you're not feeling well, mm -hmm. you're not talking to your manager about not feeling well, you're actually talking to a nurse. And a nurse is removed from the pressures of the business. A nurse isn't gonna say, well, wait a minute, like we're short staffed and we're counting on you this evening, like you need to show up. That's not gonna happen in, in the process that we've got baked into anyone calling off with illness allegations. And then that nurse is gonna say, this person needs to be out for three days. This person needs to be out for, for maybe longer. Um, but I, you know, it's interesting. I've been a lot on a lot of calls where companies implemented that and then they walked away because they thought too many people were calling off sick. And so I think some of the fear is that you're going to end up paying more for people calling off. And I'm encouraging them. I'm like, well, why don't you look at the Chipotle's history and understand what happens to your brand and to your shareholder value if people do show up work sick and you end up making other people sick. You want to avoid that at all costs. And so I think um, that the wellness policy has worked very well for us. We've been pretty successful with that. And it's it's very understood by all of our employees. And like I said, there's some pretty severe consequences if you don't do that. Um, but I don't know, Al, if you have any additional thoughts on if you're a smaller organization trying to implement something like that. No, I mean, we have similar policies, right? Because uh... We, we had to, in, in certainly because of the, the volume that we were asking to provide uh, in, to, to everyone, uh, we, had to, we had to do that. We had to have nurses, we had to have uh, wellness checks, we have to uh, take everybody's temperatures or walk in through the door and things of that nature. Uh, I think we learned a lot of things, right? Because uh, we're talking about uh, all these new technologies that were being thrown at us. And I know you all were facing the same things as or we can use this and we can use that and we can, and all of a sudden you're overwhelmed with mm -hmm. what's the newest technology that can be effective in different places. Uh, and so uh, we tried them all and certainly we've kept some of them. Certainly ventilation was, was a, was a, a key factor for us in, in our, um, in our facilities as well. But I agree with you. I mean, I think this is something that we learned a lot within that two year period and and to everyone's credit, and, and it's not just JBS, the industry learned enough to where they haven't walked away from those practices and haven't walked away from doing the things that make us all better. Mm -hmm. All righty. I hate to cut us off. I feel like we could always go on for hours in excellent discussion here. Um, but I do just want to wrap us up here at the end of the webinar and invite everyone to join us again for our next session, which will be Wednesday, December 6th. And we're going to be looking at food safety culture storytelling to shape, reinforce, and inspire. So please check out that link. It will also be available in the email that we send out in a couple of days. We look forward to seeing everybody there. And thank you all again to our panelists and our attendees for being part of this webinar series. Thank you, everyone, and have a good day.